the second day, the full on gravitational cosmology. And we start off with Benjamin's second lecture on the CMD. Well, thank you for getting up early. Um, so yesterday we talked about the uh, cosmic microwave background and the approximation that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Well, it turns out that uh, our universe is thankfully not entirely homogeneous and isotropic. And the uh, best piece of evidence we have for it is our existence. <laughs> the second best piece of evidence is our measurement of the temperature fluctuations of the cosmic microwave background. So. Um, this was first measured by the uh, COBE satellite in the early 90s. Um, and it was found that uh, there are tiny fluctuations of order one part in 10 to the five around the mean temperature. So in some directions, the sky is a little bit warmer and in other directions, it's a little bit colder. Um, so if you look at this map and ask yourself, how do you want to deal with this kind of information? then, well, first of all, you could, you could say, well, I take this map. This map, the, the Planck map has uh, a very large number of pixels. It's of order tens of millions of pixels, and that's a bit unwieldy. So we might want to um, come up with a way to compress the information that is in the map and describe it in some other way. And the most convenient way of doing that um, the angular power spectrum. So that's what I'm going to introduce now. Um, so if we have a map like that, then um, this, of course, gives us a temperature field that is defined on the surface of a sphere, right? Um, so we can write the fluctuation of the temperature divided by the mean temperature in a given direction. And let me write this as theta. And we can expand it in spherical harmonics. OK? So we'll have the sum from L equals um, 1 to infinity, and the sum over m going from minus L to L. over the spherical harmonics. So these guys are spherical harmonics. And the TLMs are the expansion coefficients. Okay, So the spherical harmonics oops, should be a are probably familiar to you um, from looking at the hydrogen atom. So whenever you have a spherical symmetry, um, it's a good idea to use spherical harmonics. So this is an illustration of the two parameters, the L parameter or the multiple. Um, so each, each spherical harmonic is a, is a polynomial of degree L. Um, and then you have the M ranging from minus L to L. So by doing this expansion, we lose nothing. We have a full description of the, of the map in terms of the expansion parameters uh, TML. Um, In the end, the, um, the maximum L you can extract is determined by the size of the pixels. So L, as we will see, um, describes the angular separation of um, two points in the sky. Uh, you, can see, you can actually see that, uh, see that here. So the larger L, the smaller the angular distance um, between a maximum and a minimum, right? So very large L correspond to um, structure on very small scales and very small scale fluctuations. 
And given that we have a pixelated map, there's a fundamental limit to um, what kind of L you can, you can take the sum up to. And beyond that, you don't, you don't gain any information anymore. OK. So our assumption of um, global isotropy and homogeneity um, cannot be upheld if we want to describe this map. But at least we can assume, and I think that's a very reasonable assumption, that um, this map was probably uh, produced in some kind of statistical process, some kind of random process. And we can assume that the statistics or the process that generates these fluctuations does not depend on where we are. So we reduce our symmetry from being globally um, isotropic and homogeneous to a statistical isotropy and homogeneity. So we assume that the, the dice we roll in, in any direction of the sky are actually the same. And if we, if we assume statistical isotropy, well, you can test that, you can test the assumption, but um, in the first place, it's a theoretical assumption. Yeah, I mean, um, it's sort of the, the next best thing you can do if you want to give up um, global isotropy. And this, this has, in fact, been tested on the Planck maps and been found to, to hold to a very good extent. Um, okay, so if we have statistical isotropy, then the ensemble average of the expansion coefficients has a very simple form. Namely, um, the ensemble average of the product between different L's, expansion coefficients with different L's, or different M's vanishes. So you only keep um, the terms where L is equal to L prime and M is equal to M prime. And then the uh, remaining coefficient only depends on L, and this is known as the angular power spectrum. So the um, pointy brackets uh, denote an ensemble average. And if your fluctuations are Gaussian, and what do I mean by Gaussian? Fluctuations are Gaussian if each of the TLMs is an independent Gaussian random variable drawn from a Gaussian distribution with mean zero and variance CL. If that is the case, then this angular power spectrum contains the entire statistical information of the map. So under the assumption of Gaussianity, we can reduce the information from 60 million pixels or whatever the number is to something of order 3,000 or so of these CLs. And we haven't lost any information. So that's very powerful, and that's why the angular power spectrum is usually the, the way to go um, when you analyze these maps. Right. So one slight problem here is that we only have one sky to observe. 
So we cannot observe an ensemble average. Yeah. If I give you a, a six-sided die and ask you to tell me whether this is a fair die and whether the average of the rolls is three and a half, um, then what are you going to do? You're going to roll it 10,000 times or so, and eventually um, it'll uh, get close to, to the average, right? So you can, you can generate an ensemble average. For our sky, we can't do that. Yeah? We are limited, for each L, we are limited to 2L plus 1 rolls of the dice. So that's like me giving you a dice and asking you to roll it 10 times and then taking it away from you. And you have to tell me whether it's a fair dice or not. And that's hard to say because um, if I then give the dice to someone else, they will get a different result and there will be a variance in the estimate. So we can, of course, estimate the, the CLs from a map, give it our best guess, so, um, and this estimator would just be the average over the TLM squared the average over all m's. And it turns out this estimator is unbiased, but it has a variance around the true value of the, of the CLs. And this variance is known as the cosmic variance. and is given by 2 on 2L plus 1 CLT squared. So this follows from the fact that the TLMs are Gaussian random variables. The square of the absolute value of Gaussian random variables um, is a chi follows a chi-squared distribution of degree um, L, and the variance of that is given by by this expression down there. So this means that we have this intrinsic uncertainty um, in comparing observations with theory because our theory can at best um, predict an expectation value, but the actual realization of the cosmic microwave background we observe might deviate from that expectation value. Okay, so let me show you plot. So if, if you look at the angular power spectrum of Planck, and we're going to try and motivate why it has this funny shape um, later in this lecture, you see the size of the error bars here. Um, there are very large error bars at small multiples corresponding to large angles. And the reason why they are large is because at those large scales, you only have a very limited number of modes to observe. That's like rolling the dice only a few times. And you have to um, guess the mean from it. Yeah? The theoretical mean of the best fit model is the green line here. But what you actually observe at a multiple of two is way, be way below that. But that's not too unusual, right? The, the green band here um, describes this uh, theoretical uncertainty uh, from, from cosmic variance. And as you go to smaller angular scales or higher multiple moments L, um, the cosmic variance will be, um, will be suppressed. Uh, since this goes like uh, 2 on 2L two plus 1. 
And in this case, even measuring again or measuring with no noise doesn't do anything because the sky doesn't change. Yeah, we, we only have one CMB sky. It would only change if you wait a few billion years until we, are, we observe, say, a different last scattering surface. Um, then you have the chance to observe a, a different realization of these, uh, of these random variables. So now we can ask ourselves, what is the correlation function between, or the, the correlation between two directions in the sky? So the expectation value of the two-point correlation function of the temperature fluctuation in direction n1 and n2 is given by sum over all l to l plus 1 on 4 pi times the angular power spectrum times pl cosine, oh, okay, let me call this theta, where theta is the angle that is subtended by the two directions. So these guys here are the Legendre polynomials. And for a given L, it's uh, again a polynomial of degree L. Um, So this, this result reflects the fact that uh, we have statistical isotropy because the correlation function does not depend on where the, in, in what direction exactly um, the, our vectors point. It only depends on the angular separation. So from this, we can easily see if we, if we take n1 equal to n2, that the root mean square temperature fluctuation is given by sum over L to L plus 1 on 4 pi CLT. And if we approximate the sum as an integral, The result looks like this. So you can interpret this as the amount of power per logarithmic interval in L is given by the angular power spectrum times this L times L plus 1 on 2 pi factor. So that means if your, your map has white noise, so it has an equal amount of power on all scales, then the power spectrum is going to behave like 1 on L times L plus 1. And for this reason, when you plot the power spectrum, what's usually plotted, okay, here it's not explicitly written, um, this DL is nothing but L times L plus 1 on 2 pi times CL. So on a log-log plot, you could directly read off the amount of power um, contributed by fluctuations on a given angular separation. 
So this was the two-point correlation function. We could also evaluate higher order correlation function, like the three-point correlation function or the four-point correlation function. And in those cases, you would have um, associated, so here we have the angular power spectrum for the two-point correlation function. For the three-point correlation function, we would have an object that's called the bispectrum that would, in this case, depend on three different L indices and so on. Um, this is much more complicated than just sticking to the angular power spectrum. Um, but this has been analyzed to great detail in, in the CMB data. And at the moment, there is no evidence for any non-trivial um, contributions from higher order correlations. So um, as far as we know now, the CMB is consistent with being Gaussian. And therefore, um, a description in terms of the two-point correlation or the angular power spectrum um, suffices to, to keep all the information that is in the map. OK, so this is how we treat the map. Now we have to go to the theory, right? How do we um, attack such a problem? And the answer is, well, we do linear perturbation theory. which doesn't always work as we heard yesterday, but in this case, um, it's actually a reasonable idea because we know that the temperature fluctuations are small. The temperature fluctuations are of a relative order 10 to the minus five. So um, if we do perturbation theory and drop all the terms that are of second and higher order in perturbation theory, we can expect to still get a result that is accurate to about one part in 10 to the 5. OK, so we have to set up the whole thing again, this time starting with the metric. And we know that the background approximation of um, isotro isotropy and homogeneity is decent. So we'll use that as, uh, as our background and perturb around this background. So note that the background metric has no dependence on x. That one is still homogeneous and isotropic. Um, and all the spatial uh, fluctuations are in, in the perturbation. Okay? And if we do that to our metric, then we also have to do that to, oops. to the stress energy tensor. And as long as these perturbations are small, we can then set up the equations and drop all terms that are of um, quadratic or higher order in the perturbations and only keep the terms that are of linear order. Now, if we wanted to write down the most general um, metric perturbation, we'd have 10 degrees of freedom, right? The metric. Uh, can be written as a four by four matrix. It's symmetric, so we have 10 degrees of freedom. However, four degrees of freedom are not physical. They can be removed by choosing a coordinate system or fixing a gauge. That leaves us with six degrees of freedom. These can be subdivided again into two scalar degrees of freedom. So these are um, perturbations that uh, transform as scalars under Lorentz transformations two vector degrees of freedom that behave like vectors on the Lorentz transformations and two tensor degrees of freedom. Um, 
that are essentially the gravitational waves that we heard about yesterday. Um, we know that in our universe, the um, initial perturbations were predominantly of the scalar type. And that's why I will ignore um, the other types of perturbations from now on and write the metric as one plus two psi times d eta squared minus one minus two phi delta i j dx i dx j. So here we see the two scalar perturbations of the metric. Um, these are functions of x and, and eta, obviously. Um, psi is the gravitational potential. And phi is the local perturbation in the scale factor. I should also mention that um, we have already made use of our freedom to fix a gauge, and this gauge is known as the conformal Newtonian gauge. So this is the perturbed metric. We can also write down the perturbed stress energy tensor. Um, that has the following form. So the not not component is just the energy density plus the perturbation in the energy density. The I naught component is equal to the naught I component and has the background density plus the background pressure times a bulk velocity. So, um, And this whole thing here is some, sometimes called Q and is the momentum density. And then we're left with the spatial part of Tij. where we have a pressure perturbation. Along the diagonal. Minus an object called pi ij, which is known as the uh, stress tensor. And pi ij has the form 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1 times rho bar plus p bar times sigma, and sigma is the anisotropic stress. Oops, that's wrong. <laughs> 
There we go. So we can now plug the perturbed metric and perturbed stress energy tensor into Einstein's equations, evaluate um, the connections, uh, the Ricci tensor, Ricci scalar, Einstein tensor, and write down Einstein's equations in the perturbed form. Um, then you will find something that contains terms that are familiar from the um, homogeneous Einstein equations. And you can just subtract the entire homogeneous Einstein equation from what you get out of there to end up with an, uh, with an equation for the perturbations. Okay, I'm going to write down um, two of the uh, Einstein equations you, you get from that here. So the first one is the form del squared phi minus 3 h phi dot plus h psi equals 4 pi g a squared delta rho. This is the Poisson equation. And in the limit where you have no expansion, um, A is constant, H is zero, so this term drops out and you're just left with the regular Poisson equation of uh, Newtonian physics. So it turns out that um, this term only becomes important um, for very long wavelength fluctuations yeah, when the gradient is very small. So the second um, equation we, can, we get out of the Einstein equations um, looks like this. And what this tells us is that um, in the absence of uh, anisotropic stress, phi and psi have to be equal. Yeah? Um, and in that case, they both um, sort of uh, reduce to the Newtonian potential and you recover, um, if, if A is constant, you recover the um, uh, Newtonian uh, metric. Okay, you can get two more equations out of uh, taking advantage um, of the fact that the covariant derivative of the energy momentum tensor is uh, conserved. I'm not going to write them down here, but uh, I'm just going to note that uh, delta mu t mu nu equals zero gives you two more equations, um, a continuity equation and another equation called the Euler equation. So these are equations that tell you how the um, energy density perturbation and how the momentum density perturbation uh, evolve. So these are the basic tools we need to describe the CMB anisotropies. Um, so let's do that. So in a very hand-waving and schematic way, um, the way one proceeds to calculate the, the CMB anisotropies is that you start from some initial perturbation, 
So that would describe the state of the fluctuations at a very early time, way before recombination and decoupling. Then you evolve this system up to the point of decoupling. And at decoupling, you're going to need to know the um, density fluctuation in the photons. Let me define, actually, uh, delta gamma as delta rho gamma on rho gamma. You're going to need to know the evolution of the potentials. And you're going to need to know the velocities of the electrons. And all of these need to be evaluated at the point of decoupling. So from that point onwards, we have free streaming. So what we'll need to do here is to essentially evaluate the um, Boltzmann equation for the photon perturbation in the absence of, uh, of coupling. And we will also have to take into account a projection effect when going from um, three-dimensional plane waves to perturbations on the sphere. And this will give us the temperature perturbation in a given direction. And once we have that, we've already seen how to um, calculate the CLs from there. So let's start with the initial perturbations. So where do they come from? Well, in, in the standard picture of cosmology, um, these infl um, initial perturbations were generated during inflation, where you had uh, quantum fluctuations of the inflaton field. These quantum fluctuations of the inflaton field source um, curvature perturbations. The curvature perturbations by the exponential expansion get stretched beyond the Hubble radius. And once their wavelength is larger than the Hubble radius, they stop evolving and freeze it. Yeah. And then much later during radiation domination, these wavelengths enter, these perturbations re-enter the horizon and become, um, uh, become dynamical again. And at that point, we can start, or we have to start tracing their, their evolution. Now, it turns out that inflation generically, um, at least if you assume that inflation was driven only by a single field. Um, and if that's the case, then inflation predicts perturbations of a type that are called adiabatic. So inflation single field gives adiabatic fluctuations. And what does that mean? That means if you have different fluids, delta rho A on rho A times one plus equation of state parameter to the minus one is delta rho B on rho B times one plus W B to the minus one for all different species A and B. And in particular, this implies that um, delta gamma, so photons that behave like radiation and have a, uh, an equation of state parameter of a third, uh, is equal to four thirds times delta matter because matter has an equation of state parameter of zero. Specifically, this also means that um, 
overdensities in one fluid coincide with overdensities in, in all other fluids and vice versa for the un under densities. So we expect to see adiabatic fluctuations and Oh, they are species. So A and A and B are um, gamma, neutrinos, dark matter, baryons. Okay, so inflation generates perturbations and um, if you want to describe these perturbations, it's best to do that in a gauge invariant way. And a good gauge invariant quantity is the curvature perturbation. Um, curly R. And the statistics of these fluctuations are described to a very good approximation in most models. Um, in terms of the two-point correlation function of the curvature perturbation. And if we look at this in momentum space, so we do a Fourier transform of this. These are the Fourier components of R. Then the two-point correlation function um, can be written as 2 pi squared on k cubed times the power spectrum. So this, this curly curvature. Yes, it's a, curv it's a curvature perturbation on spatial slices. Yes. That's right. I mean, naively, you, you might want to think um, you get perturbations in the inflaton field, but that's not gauge invariant. By, by going to um, an appropriate coordinate system, you can, you can always uh, choose your coordinates such that the inflaton perturbation vanishes. But the curvature is a, is a gauge invariant. Um, uh, geometric quantity and so that's uh, that's what one should use to to describe inflationary perturbations I suppose you could yes But then that would be your new background metric, basically. Your, your background metric would not be simple anymore. Not convinced? <laughs> anyway, so the typical prediction of slow roll inflation models is that this PR of K has a very simple form and it's just a power law. So this is a pivot scale and the scale dependence of the, of the power law is given by the spectral index. And for historical reasons, there is a minus one there. So if you plot this, okay, and ns is roughly one. So if you plot this on a log-log plot, log of the wave number versus log of PR, that would just give you a straight line. 
So inflation predicts uh, an almost scale invariant um, spectrum of Gaussian adiabatic um, curvature perturbations. So this is what we're starting out with. Then we can look at the evolution of perturbations. before decoupling. And I'm going to skip over the formalities here. Basically, this requires solving the combination of the two equations that I didn't write down. So um, that was the Euler equation and the continuity equation. Turns out if you, if you do write down these equations, um, then you find for the photon perturbation, and the photons are tightly coupled to, to matter at this point, so therefore you can treat them as a single fluid. You find that the single fluid obeys the equation of motion of a damped driven oscillator. Okay, so what happens physically is that if you have an overdensity in your photons, then due to the choice of uh, adiabatic initial per, um, conditions, you would also have an overdensity in the matter and in the electrons there. And initially, this would start contracting under gravity. So let's say this is your overdensity then gravity wants to pull it in. But once you compress the um, photon baryon fluid, the pressure will start acting in the other direction. So you will have a force counteracting gravity. So you, you won't have um, unhindered collapse of this overdensity, but instead you will have an oscillation of this overdensity. So you start out with an overdensity, it starts collapsing, pressure pushes it out until it actually becomes an underdensity, and then it falls back in. And this process is called acoustic oscillations. I think that's the question of uh, how big the, uh, the damping term is, right? If you over damp your oscillation, then you very quickly find the, um, the, the equilibrium situation where, where pressure and, and gravity, uh, gravitational pressure are equal. But if the, if the damping is small, then it can go on for quite a while. So the, um, the friction term is proportional to the expansion rate. But, I mean, this, this is not a critically damped um, oscillation. This, this is an actual oscillation that, uh, that happens. Um, so just schematically, what do you expect for the behavior of delta gamma. So let's say you start with an overdensity here. 
And now the behavior will crucially depend on the wavelength of this perturbation. I already mentioned before, if the wavelength of a perturbation is larger than the Hubble radius, then nothing happens. Is everyone else getting an emergency alert? Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> Got a bit uh, confused by that. Okay. Um, so if you have a perturbation that has um, that is larger than the Hubble radius, even at recombination, then this perturbation won't do anything. Yeah, it remains frozen in. Now, if you go to uh, the other way around, should be smaller than. Yeah, thanks. So, if you go to a um, slightly shorter wavelengths such that a wavelength enters the horizon just before recombination, then you might at some point come to a wavelength where, so let me mark this here as decoupling. So this would be a wave, um, a fluctuation of a wavelength that enters the Hubble radius just before decoupling, so about at this point, and then starts collapsing. And before pressure has the time to reverse the collapse, decoupling happens. And it gets stuck here. If we go to yet another smaller wavelength that enters the horizon, let's say, here. This may have had the time to undergo one full oscillation. So it oscillates. So I should uh, slightly change that plot, sorry. Let me put zero here. Um, and it undergoes one rarefaction, so it's actually at the minimum of the density. So you may notice that um, I've, I've drawn this, uh, this oscillation slightly offset from zero. Why did I, why did I do that? Why, why doesn't it oscillate around zero? And the reason is that we don't only have baryons and photons, these oscillations also happen in, well, happen in the gravitational potential sourced by the baryons, photons, and the dark matter. And the dark matter does not participate in the, um, in the oscillations, so it provides a driving force. Yeah. And therefore, the, the zero point of the oscillation is slightly offset. So this offset comes from the presence of dark matter. So the shorter the wavelength of an oscillation, the earlier it re-enters the Hubble radius, and the more time it has to undergo acoustic oscillations. And if we now look at the, the square of what I what I drew there. Evaluated at the time of recombination, and I draw that versus K, then 
for very small k or very long wavelengths, we have nothing happening. Then we have those that start collapsing. So this wavelength here corresponds to the one up here. Then we have the one that undergoes one rarefaction, so that would correspond to this wave number. Then it would compress again. Rarefaction, compression, and so on. So what you expect from this kind of evolution is that the odd peaks are enhanced with respect to the even peaks. And we will find this, this pattern again in the cosmic microwave, in, in the angular power spectrum, as we will see. So this gives us an idea of what the perturbations look like when we actually get to the last scattering surface. But we don't observe the last scattering surface directly. Um, things have to propagate to us. Yeah? So we'll have to take that into account as well. So if we look at the last scattering surface, we are here. The photon gets emitted here, and this is direction N. So we have a temperature perturbation on the last scattering surface, and we want to know how this evolves until it reaches us. Okay. One thing we um, have to take into account additionally is that the photons get emitted um, by hydrogen atoms um, at recombination. So we need to take into account the velocity of the electron fluid at the time of emission, because that will um, contribute a Doppler effect. Okay, so if this is the velocity of the electron at emission, then the photon will, um, will pick up a blue shift that is proportional to the um, projection of the electron velocity um, to the direction of observation. And if the electron were to move in this direction, then it would pick up a red shift. So schematically, what we want to do is to calculate the temperature perturbation today in a given direction. And in order to do that, we integrate along the line of sight over all the changes to the temperature that happen as a function of, um, of time. Yeah. So we integrate along the line of sight. And the thing we're integrating over is called a source function. And this can be obtained from solving the Boltzmann equation. And the result for the source function is e to the minus tau, where tau is the optical depth, 
times the term that depends on the um, derivatives of the potentials. And here's our friend the visibility function. So this is the visibility function. This is the monopole of theta. Okay, and this is the velocity. Um, VE is the velocity of the electrons at the time of emission. Okay, so we want to integrate over this. Um, we saw that the visibility function is very sharply peaked. So it's not too wrong to make the assumption that um, the visibility function is actually a delta function so that we have instantaneous decoupling. And if the visibility function is a delta function, then this becomes a heavy side function. That is one after decoupling and zero before. Um, so if we assume instantaneous decoupling, then we find that theta, theta naught n is approximately given by theta naught plus psi at decoupling minus and dot V evaluated at decoupling plus an integral over the time derivative of the potentials. Okay, so this is a very important result and this actually has a very nice physical interpretation. So let us look at these terms one by one. First start with theta naught plus psi evaluated at decoupling. So theta naught can be interpreted as the intrinsic temperature at that point. So that's just the, the temperature of the photons um, at decoupling, intrinsic temperature. Um, and when, so let's look at the, um, at the potential, the gravitational potential. So let's say we are here. Um, so this is eta naught. And along the photon path, ignoring fluctuations in the potential, potential on the way, it might first have to climb out of a potential well or roll down a potential hill. Yeah. So this is basically the um, potential difference to background at emission. So for adiabatic perturbations, the two of them are not uh, independent of each other because we know that over densities in the photons correspond to over densities in the matter and therefore also to over densities in the potential. Yeah. So um, for adiabatic perturbations, we have Theta naught is roughly given by delta gamma, well, that's the universal, is uh, roughly given by a quarter of the density perturbation, of the uh, photon perturbation. And the gravitational potential 
or minus two times the gravitational potential um, is roughly the matter perturbation. But we know that the matter perturbation in adiabatic perturbations is three quarters times the photon perturbation. And therefore, um, the sum of these two, and this is known as the Sachs-Wolf term, Theta Sachs Wolf in this case is minus one eighth delta gamma. So this means if we have an overdensity in the photons, we start out initially hotter, but by having to climb out of the potential well, the resulting temperature perturbation is actually negative. So what we see as cold spots in the sky actually corresponds to over densities on the last scattering surface. And the other way around for under densities. Under densities on the last scattering surface show up as hot spots in the CMB sky. Okay, then we have the Doppler term. That's pretty straightforward. So you just look at the projection of the electron velocity along the line of sight at emission, and that imparts a redshift or blue shift on the emitted photon with respect to the, um, uh, to the average. And then we have the integral term. This one is known as the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect. How can we interpret that? Well, Let's imagine we have uh, an overdensity on the path of the photons from the last scattering surface to us. If the photon falls into the potential well, it gets blue shifted. If it climbs out again, it gets red shifted. If the potential well remains constant while the photon traverses it, then the blue shift and the red shift will exactly cancel and nothing happens. If, however, the potential changes form while the photon goes through it. So for instance, if the potential decays a bit, then the blue shift it gets when it falls in will be larger than the red shift that it, uh, um, that it undergoes when it climbs out. Yeah? So changes in the gravitational potential and this is exactly what's encoded in the time derivatives of, uh, of phi and psi, will generate additional perturbations. Okay? Um, now, one can show that during matter domination, Uh, phi dot and psi dot are conserved. So as long as we have matter domination, the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect will not contribute any additional anisotropy. But it will do so at early times, so just after decoupling. Decoupling happens at uh, a redshift of 1100 or so. Um, Matter radiation equality is at a redshift of 3,000. So we are sort of starting to get into the matter dominated regime, but there is still a little bit of radiation energy density left at decoupling. So um, uh, around decoupling, we have 
still a bit of radiation and that leads to a decay of the gravitational potentials. So this is at early times and the same thing happens again at late times. So around a redshift of two or so, dark energy takes over. So in dark energy domination, um, we also get decaying potentials. So and for this reason, this is called the early and late integrated Sachs-Wolf effect. Okay. Now we have to talk about the projection. Um, in general, when you um, deal with perturbations, it's a good idea to work in Fourier space. So to treat all the perturbations as plane waves. But what we observe in the sky is the surface of a sphere. So we need to project the plane waves to the surface of a sphere. Okay. Um, I'm just going to write down the solution of that. So we want to express the temperature fluctuations. So first we do a Fourier transform of the temperature perturbation. That gives us the Fourier components theta of K. And then we want to project them onto the surface of the sphere to give us the multiples, the multiple moments. So what we find is that for the Sachs-Wolf term, this projection um, requires a spherical Bessel function. And chi star is the distance, co-moving distance, to the last scattering surface. Okay, we find a similar expression for the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect. And for the Doppler term, we end up with the derivative of the spherical Bessel function. So the spherical Bessel functions are really ugly. Um, there, this is an example. So they tend to have a peak um, around the, uh, so, around their index, so J L will peak around X equals L, um, but then they have this tail of oscillations. Yeah. So if you want to um, do the integration numerically, this, this can be a very nasty business. Um, but most of the 
most of the volume actually of the, of the Bessel function is around uh, x equals L. Yeah? So if we look at the, um, at the argument here, the argument of the Bessel function is k times chi star. Um, this essentially relates wavelengths or wave numbers k to multiples L. But it's not entirely a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's a convolution um, with, the, with the Bessel function. I'm going to need five minutes. Huh? So now we can put it all together. And get the angular power spectrum by integrating over all the plane waves. of the multiple expansion of the temperature field times the initial power spectrum of, of perturbations. So this bit encodes the primordial information and this bit is all the physics in between. Basically. So it's evolution plus projection. And schematically, what do we find? <sighs> we can look at the contributions of all the different terms we, we discussed. So the Sachs-Wolf effect, um, the initial Sachs-Wolf effect, at very large scales, you have not undergone any, any acoustic oscillations. Then, oops, here you get the first peak. Um, so this is, these are the modes that have undergone one compression. These are the modes that have undergone one compression, one rarefaction. This one is compression again and so on. So you see that the Doppler peaks are actually phase shifted and that has to do with the fact that the um, velocity of the, of the fluid is maximal um, when, your, when the density perturbation is minimal. Yeah? So there's a, um, a pi half phase shift between the, the velocity and the density perturbation. And that's why the peaks of the Doppler contribution coincide with the minima of the, um, of the square of the Sachs-Wolf contribution. Okay? So that's why the, the power spectrum doesn't go to zero, but actually has contributions on all scales. Then we have the late integrated Sachs-Wolf effect um, that's from dark energy that only affects the scales that enter the horizon very late. And the early integrated Sachs-Wolf effect that mostly affects the scales uh, um, that enter the horizon around decoupling. Okay, there are just two more extra complications I wanted to um, talk about. One we already mentioned last time, and that is reionization, so around a redshift of 10. Um, the universe um, becomes ionized again, and a small portion of the CMB photons actually scatter again. And the effect of that is a suppression of scales within the horizon at reionization. 
and the suppression is proportional. The um, delta C L T is proportional to e to the minus two tau. Oh, sorry. It works. It works? Okay. Oh, that battery. Alrighty. So the effect of that is that scales that are already within the horizon um, during reionization get suppressed by a factor of e to the minus 2 tau, um, where tau is the optical depth to reionization. So this is an effect that is very, at least in temperature, is very hard to disentangle. Um, from just changing the overall amplitude because only this, the largest um, scales are not affected by this and they were dominated by cosmic variance. But uh, CMB polarization has an, uh, a very specific signal um, from reionization that can be used to disentangle these two effects. Um, and the final thing I want to mention is photon diffusion. So basically just before um, decoupling, the photons scatter a lot and they perform a random walk. Yeah? So if we look into a direction in the sky, then the photon that, is, that we observe as coming from here might actually have originated somewhere here and then undergone a random walk until it last scattered. Okay. So um, what that means is that when we look in this direction, some of the information about the temperature will actually come from here. Yeah? So on scales that are sort of within the radius of the random walk, um, the perturbations will be smoothed out. So we get a suppression of perturbations on oops, scales smaller than the so-called diffusion scale. And the diffusion scale um, is roughly given by the integral from zero to decoupling d eta times one on a times number density of electrons times the Thomson scattering cross section. Okay, so this is, this is basically the mean free path of the electrons, uh, sorry, of the photons, and this gives you the, the number of uh, scatterings the photon undergoes um, from the earliest times up to uh, recombination. So the effect of that is a suppression, delta CL, oh, right, sorry that the CLs um, go like e to the minus k on kd squared. So it's an exponential suppression of the smallest scales in the CLs. And we can see that best if we look at a log plot of the cosmic microwave background uh, angular power spectrum. So the Diffusion scale, the damping scale, corresponds roughly to a multiple of uh, a thousand or so. And from here onwards, um, 
you find an exponential suppression of, of power. So if, if there was no diffusion, then you would expect this oscillatory pattern to just continue all the way up here. But due to diffusion, this is all suppressed. And in practice, that limits the amount of information we can learn from the CMB because um, at small scales, the signal we observe uh, in the sky will be dominated by foreground emission. Yeah. So only actually up to L of 2,500 or so um, is the CMB the dominating signal in the sky. Okay, so I've gone way over time. Apologies. Um, I'll leave you to some questions. Yes, but um, the angular scale is related to um, the distance to the last scattering surface, right? So um, this comes from the uh, where do we have it? The projection. Here. So L is roughly, so the, the, the contribution from, um, from this is roughly maximal at L equals K times this distance. Yeah. So from measuring the L, the position of the first peak basically is at a multiple of roughly 200. And we can calculate this distance and that gives us the, the physical scale of the oscillations. Yeah? The so-called baryon acoustic oscillation scale. And this is something we can, we can also observe um, in large scale structure because there, there it is imprinted um, as a slight excess in the, the two-point correlation function at a certain distance. So we can measure this um, acoustic oscillation scale at very early times, and we can also measure its value at very late times. And that's a very powerful tool. So the, the CMB in itself is mostly sensitive to, to physics around recombination, um, and many physical models, like, I don't know, dynamical dark energy models or something, um, uh, predict new dynamics at low redshift, right? So in, in those cases, it's, it can be very helpful to combine um, CMB data with low redshift data to, to break possible degeneracies. Um, you mean the integrated Sachs Wolf effect? Yeah, so this uh, one here? Yeah, yeah. 
Yep. Five star and also integral the enter prime five star. So that's my guess. Yes. No. So this means we evaluate the actual photon temperature monopole and the the potential at the point of uh, decoupling. So this is just the function value at at decoupling. This, however, is the integral over the change in the potentials along the way, along the line of sight of the photon. Yes, so these are two different things. No, because, okay, I, I should, um, uh, l let me clarify this. So this integral goes from decoupling until today. And this is actually the, the effect of the evolution from um, time equals zero, from, from very early times until decoupling. This is not, yeah, the, the dot is a derivative with res respect to conformal time. That's not a boundary integral, that's the line of sight integral. That goes from the last scattering surface to us. So we, we integrate along the photon path the, um, over conformal time Um, no, but you, you can't just you can't just evaluate it at the boundaries, yeah. uh, right? Because what what you what you physically evaluate here is the temperature change of the photon due to the change in the potential as the photon moves through it. So this doesn't know anything about um, what, what happens at the last scattering surface. It's independent of it. Sydney time by his screen is 11. <laughs> <laughs>